<clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Uh, please take your seats. Uh, thank you very much for joining us bright and early uh, today. We're really, I'm really looking forward to this panel. Um, the crisis has clearly had loads of effects, very different effects on different groups. And so inequality, which is the broad topic of this panel, uh, is, is clearly, clearly a really key issue. So our chair today is Bethan Statton. She's from the FT, and she's joined by a host of experts uh, to discuss this question with you. So I'd like to welcome Bethan and her panel. everyone. Um, thanks very much for joining us today. Um, so as Richard mentioned, we're discussing the ways in which the coronavirus crisis has generated and kind of perpetuated different kinds of unfairnesses and inequalities. Obviously, many of these existed before the pandemic and were pretty stark before the pandemic. We'll be thinking about inequalities <coughs> in age, income, different kinds of job quality, um, gender, um, and other issues that the panel are really well qualified to, to talk about today. Um, so we're joined by Abby Adams um, Prattle, who's an economics professor at the University of Oxford um, and a co-founder of the COVID Inequality Project, which you might hear a bit more about too. Um, Jane Fonsale, um, who's the CEO of the Working uh, uh, Families um, Charity, Working Families, um, the UK's work-life balance charity. Um, Jagjit Chadha, the director of the National Institute for Economic and Social Research. Sarah Smith, um, economics professor at the University of Bristol. And Richard Blundell, who's the Ricardo Professor of Political Economy um, at the Economics <laughs> Department of UCL. True. Um, <laughs> so, each of our panellists are going to talk for about 10 minutes um, about some of the different dimensions of inequality that the pandemic has kind of created and perpetuated. We'll then open the floor for a couple of questions, um, and they're of course very much welcomed. Um, please have a think about what you might want to ask, um, and I'll ask you, Abby, uh, first um, to, to set us off. Okay, perfect. Thank you um, so much, Bethan, for the introduction and uh, to the organisers for the opportunity to speak to you all today. It's like a real joy being able to be here in person, I have to say. Um, so just to give a little bit of context in terms of where I'll be coming from. Um, so as Bethan said, um, on the eve of the crisis, uh, me and uh, three co-authors, Theodora Boneva, who's now at um, the University of Bonn, uh, Marta Golan, who um, is at the University of Zurich, and Chris Rao, um, who's at Cambridge. Um, we started running a series of so-called real-time surveys in order to better understand the impacts that the pandemic was having um, on the labour market um, and on different groups of workers. Um, and then in addition to that, because of some of the patterns we were finding, um, I was a specialist advisor to the Women and Equalities Select Committee, um, specifically looking at the gendered economic impact of the pandemic. So I kind of had both the, uh, like kind of a little bit of background from if you like the kind of pure economics um, side, and then uh, the slightly more messy world of actually what was happening um, uh, in more of the political space um, over, over the course of the last 18 months. And so what I'd really like to talk about is, I guess, kind of two things. So what is it that COVID has taught us about access to decent, secure work? And how, is that, how do we need to think about hybrid working and working from home um, in this context? Um, and the kind of second aspect, which I only talk a little bit about, because I know others on, in the panel are going to be kind of exploring this in more detail, is how does this interact with how we think about gender inequality um, and specifically about the role um, and uh, the role of care um, and investments um, in, in the caregiving infrastructure uh, within the economy um, as a whole. So when we kind of setting the scene as to where we were as an economy on the kind of, you know, last March, um, so on one sense, like, 
things look pretty rosy. So the UK had record high employment at about 77%, um, and up from, you know, this was up from about 70% on the eve of the financial crisis. But of course, this kind of mass, a number of kind of broader malaises uh, that you might have thought about when trying to assess what the kind of the quality of work was um, in the UK economy. So there were, you know, this really mass big change in the composition of work. So self-employment, especially uh, low-wage solo self-employment, accounted for almost half of the employment growth between the financial crisis um, and, uh, and, and the eve of COVID. Now, something that I've thought a lot about as well is and it's not just this, even within employment, we have uh, ch quite big changes that had been occurring in terms of the composition and organization of work, um, which haven't been very well captured in the historic ways that we've measured the labor market. Um, so since 2014, there has been this debate about the role of zero hours contracts um, in the economy. But if you look at the, you know, the official numbers of, labor, of, of zero hours contracts that come out of things like the labor force survey, typically you see a, what looks like a pretty small labor market phenomenon. <coughs> typically you're getting numbers in the region of like three to four percent of like total employment. But one of the things is, I think, that this <laughs> kind of uh, is that there's an issue with the way we measure this, um, because there's actually a plethora of these kind of flexible, uh, perhaps insecure, you might say, working arrangements, which are not pure zero hours contracts, which get missed out of this definition. So one thing I was doing just before the crisis was analyzing the text of job vacancies in order to get a better idea of the prevalence of different forms of flexible and insecure work. And so what you see there is actually about 30% of jobs in the UK economy are, uh, are advertised um, as flexible, and about half of those are what I'm going to call insecure flexibility. Okay, So these are jobs which open up workers uh, to earnings risk. And typically you think that it's employers who are controlling those working schedules. And then you see about 15% being on the other side, where that flexibility is being offered in higher wage jobs alongside a salary which actually, you know, is kind of insuring individuals from that earnings risk. So what we did was, um, during the pandemic, we actually validated this measure from the job vacancies. Um, and so in both our surveys th and uh, in through a question asking about control of working hours, which also got introduced into nationally representative surveys, so one called um, uh, the, uh, the uh, sorry, USOC, I was trying to think about what, that, uh, <laughs> what the acronym <laughs> stood for. I mean, again, we see that actually about 30% of jobs in the UK are flexible, and it's about 15% of those are, if, if you like, this bad type of flexibility. Um, so that's kind of, and, and, and why do we care about this? Well, over COVID, individuals in these forms of jobs were less insured by their employers in terms of the nature of the shock. So they suffered larger falls in earnings and more um, kind of, you know, greater financial precarity. The other thing is that in the UK, it's not just about what employers are doing, number of other benefits get, if you like, attached to employment relationships. So if you think about sick pay, for example, or the fact that while zero hours contract workers were allowed to be furloughed, what you see in a number of government reports is because, you know, you need to like, because of the way that these schemes get set up, individuals on these insecure work arrangements were more likely to fall through the gaps in these forms of employment of these government support, which get attached to employment relationships because they're insecure, because individuals typically might be moving between employers much more and therefore kind of fall through some of the gaps in this eligibility. So let's think about uh, hybrid work um, in this context. So what, you know, working from home, it's clearly going to be a much bigger deal um, going forward. Uh, so one of the things we were measuring in the COVID kind of inequality project was how easy was it for individuals or what percentage of individuals' tasks did they think they could do from home? And what you see is, unsurprisingly, over the course of the pandemic, uh, either people have realized that we can do more work from home and also it, well, firms have been making more investments in making it easier for people to work from home. So we might expect, given those two things, that at least some portion of you know, working from home is going to persist um, into, the, um, into the recovery. <coughs> now this is kind of, I think, two in, uh, well, this has, okay, multiple very complicated interactions in the economy. So 
uh, it's going to potentially change the spatial dimension of, of, of how we think about inequality, okay? Uh, because the boundaries of labor markets are going to change, um, and so you might be able to live and work in different places, potentially opening up more opportunities. But it also changes where is money being spent in the economy, and because kind of this changing uh, composition of consumption. Now, it also, however, the same, it, when we're think about thinking post-COVID, it's not the case that we're going to have exactly the same jobs uh, advertised as uh, working from home versus not working from home, okay? So working from home is not just a change in the location of work. Typically, other aspects of jobs change when they go remote. So what you can again see before the pandemic is jobs which were advertised as working from home add a narrower, they advertise with a, a narrower set of skills, in which kind of makes sense because if you've got some people remote, others people not, you need to be able to kind of fit all of this colo, you know, you need to fit all these different remote people together in a way which is more tightly controlled. And so one thing which I think is really interesting is what does this mean for career progression going forwards for individuals in these remote forms of work? Because if you do have these narrower jobs, it's less likely that they're going to be offered the same opportunities and potentially wage progression um, as uh, what you might have thought of if that work was not remote. So this leads me to another thing about gender, and this is the point, um, this is the point that I will end on. So um, this interaction between flexibility and gender is kind of is, 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 is complicated and there are forces pushing us in two directions. So on the, on the one hand, flexible work is good because you know, you've got a lower fixed cost to work. It makes it easier for mothers who, because of other inequalities in caregiving, you know, they want to be able to have more flexibility in combining paid work uh, with domestic work. But at the same time, Flexible jobs, as I just said, that, uh, many flexible jobs were bad jobs, were these insecure jobs, but they also, if we think that these flexible working from home jobs in the future might be narrower, that could offer less opportunities. Um, I was analyzing data from an online labor market before the crisis, so this is a labor market in which firms and workers are matching fully online, okay? And um, there's no, anyway, I can talk about it more in the, in, the, in, the, in the questions if people are interested. But what I just wanted to say about that was mothers on these online labor markets were earning 20% less per hour uh, than other workers. And that was largely because of interruptions um, to their work schedules caused by uh, domestic care responsibilities. So working from home is not typically the same thing for mothers as it is for people without care responsibilities. Um, and given that early so evidence as well that we've been collecting on the COVID inequality project over this summer, um, what we see is that mothers are 29% more likely to say that they're wanting to switch jobs at the moment in order to facilitate more working from home. So this is something that we do need to think about. And finally, when we look at gender differences in the propensity to take up furlough, mothers were 10% more likely than fathers to initiate furlough. Okay, i.e. asked we put on furlough, um, and, it's only, and this is only happening for people with kids. So there is clearly this demand coming through in terms of wanting more flexible work to balance care. This work is, working from home is interacting with care, and we need to be really careful about how we think about that in terms of kind of gender equality going forward. Um, how many, do I have like one minute? I can't, I haven't, it's hard with not having no, it. Yeah, that's fine, go for it. Go, I've got <laughs> one minute, okay, cool. Um, so, um, I think what this really kind of says when we're thinking about um, gender in the labor market is we, well, we need to think care, uh, think of childcare as an important piece of public infrastructure with important kind of positive externalities. Um, and what that has just been completely devoid from how we have been talking about the economy and the economic issues over COVID um, when we look at the political space. So um, one thing I'll um, end on was um, a quote from um, Kemi Badnock MP. Well, I'm sorry, paraphrase <laughs> Kemi Badnock MP um, from um, uh, uh, an evidence session that she gave to the Women and Equality Select Committee when she was being asked, okay, given the central role of childcare and facilitating caregivers to go out and work and operate on the same basis in the labor market, why has there been no targeted financial package going towards supporting the childcare industry um, over the course of the pandemic? And the answer was, well, you need to think about other sectors of the economy which has also been heavily impacted 
like nightclubs. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, we don't want to give targeted cash to nightclubs because, you know, you know, it all, you know, we need to see these things kind of, you know, just, and uh, what I want to kind of leave you on is to really think about, you know, <laughs> why we might think that's quite a kind of um, narrow and perhaps incorrect way about thinking about the kind of the social use of kind of public funds because, you know, what we, th what we should think about is childcare like roads, like electricity, it's about facilitating the economy uh, kind of working more broadly and fairly for everyone. Okay, I'll end there. Thank you. That's great. Thanks so much, um, Abby. And I, I thought as well, very interesting from what you were saying, was the questions about not being able to capture data about kind of things like insecurity. I've really, as a reporter, experienced that when I cover universities and know, we all know that there's a problem with employment patterns and structures at universities, but it's very difficult to capture the data about who's insecure and, and who's not. But I think um, what your, the theme of, uh, of, of, of your address links really well to Jane's work um, uh, with working families and, and work-life balance. So um, do you want to go ahead, Jane? Sure. Hello, everybody. Sorry, I'm shouting here. Um, I I'm so excited to be in a room with real people. I'm not an academic. I have to say that up front. Um, so I'm a little awed to be one in the room and two on the panel. Um, I remember this from 40 plus years ago when I was a student. It's fabulous being in your position. Um, I hope you have a wonderful time. It gets easier, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> then it's slightly more complicated, but it's definitely easier. Um, so Working Families is a charity. We're a small charity. Um, we've been around for 40 years, starting in the late 70s, and started by a gr group of women who were mothers and who were put in a position where they were expected to go back to work, but to work in jobs that were insecure and jobs that were definitely significantly less than their ability. Um, and that hasn't changed in 40 years. Very frequently mothers, particularly mothers who aren't educated, are put in a position where the only jobs that they can get are very low paid jobs, jobs in childcare, jobs in adult care, jobs cleaning. Um, and that has a significant issue for them throughout their lives. Um, one of the most outstanding statistics that I know about is that on average, when a woman retires, she will retire on a pension pot, which is one-fifth the size of the pension pot that a man will retire on. And generally, women li live much longer than men. So as a society, we are all going to be paying for that. And looking at the age of most of you in the room, it's you that are going to be paying for that. So there's a huge issue with the gender pay gap and the impact of that over the lifetime of women working. So Working Families does three things. We provide a free legal advice line to working parents and carers to contact us in order to understand what their employment rights are at work and how they can actually get those employment rights because there's a significant lack of access to justice. We have calls from people saying, for example, I've just told my boss I'm pregnant and he's told me I'm fired. And if you don't have access to um, a lawyer, it's very, very difficult to do very much in that position. So as, an, as a charity, what we do is we work with people to encourage them to negotiate. So there are some very basic things which they can do in terms of telling their bosses what, what the rules are, um, what is legal and what is illegal. But fundamentally, if you don't have the power um, to m make any change, then you're position where you simply don't have a job. Um, last year, we um, ad advised 3,100 individuals, but much more importantly, what we do provide, and this is with the help of a lot of law firms um, doing this for us pro bono, we had 1.6 million unique views of our advice pages. So that's people coming to look at, for example, how do I request flexible working? We have a template on our um, website which is downloaded 9,000 times a month. So there clearly is a huge demand. So then the second thing we do, um, and the way we mostly get our money, is we work with employers to help them create, build, and sustain 
flexible and family-friendly workplaces. And the way in which we do that is we go in, we review their policies. There are four things that are critical. One is good quality job design. So understanding what the job is, can it be done in the hours apportioned to it? Because many jobs can't actually be done in the hours that are given. Um, which is a significant issue. I mean, I, I'd actually suspect that for most of the academics on the panel, they can't do their jobs <laughs> in the hours that they're given. Um, but, you know, we're talking about a different end of the, of the market. Um, then the culture within the organisation is absolutely critical. Um, I went to a professional services firm and talked to a bunch of young fathers. These were all men under 40 on International Father's Day. And they were given 26 weeks leave um, for their children when their children were born. Uh, they were all encouraged by their line managers to take this because they were paid at around 80% of salary. And many of their partners were not in roles where they were being paid 80% of salary. So what was happening was that these men were taking these 26 weeks, which is fantastic, then they were coming back to work and having developed a relationship with their children, they actually wanted to continue to work flexibly. And every single one of them was denied their flexible working requests, except for one division, which was headed up by a man who was a widower. So his partner had died and he was raising his children alone. And he was the only man in that environment who understood what flexible working could be so that was um, a case in point. So culture is absolutely critical. Line managers need to be trained in order to manage people who are working flexibly. Um, so those are, the, those are the most important things. And the other thing, of course, about working flexibly, as has already been said, flexible working is not only remote working. So remote working or working from home is something that can really only be done by what we as a charity would call knowledge workers. So knowledge workers are all of you and all of us up here. They're not place-based workers. So they're not for all of what we would have called key workers during the pandemic. So anybody who is cleaning, anybody who is caring for somebody, anybody working in a hospital, anyone working in catering, if you need to be where people are, then your ability to work from home doesn't exist. But what does work and can work if your organisation is, is keen to help you do this is part-time working, job shares or flexing. So if a entire group, uh, if a team do self-rostering. So we take both of those views and this is what makes us unique as a charity. We take the view of what we know is not working and where the significant lacks of lack of access to justice exist. And we then also, through our work with employers, so we have about 160 large employers who pay us a fee every year and we work with them to improve the way in which they work. Um, and as I said, we train their line managers. Um, we use those views to influence policy. So we are part of the government's flexible working task force and have been since it started in 2018, early 2018. Currently, um, you can request the right to work flexibly after you have been employed for 26 weeks. So that's absolutely no use if you arrive at a job and you've got two children under five, you're in the middle of a pandemic and you've got to work from home. Um, as we had calls from people who were literally call operators, call center operators, who were being told that they had to accept every single call and they were single parents at home with two children under five running around. That's just not possible. And we live in a world where care is gendered, again, as, <laughs> as has been said, adult care and child care is gendered. So 26 weeks, real problem, and most employers will quite often only give it to women, not to men. Um, younger people are requesting flexible working for all kinds of different reasons. So there is a, m a big push to get flexible working arrangements throughout the workplace, but that is problematic. So at the moment, there's a flexible working consultation out, which government is doing, which is asking if, if we think it's okay 
for people to be able to request the right to work flexibly from day one. That is not a right to get flexible working, it is merely the right to request flexible working. So it doesn't particularly improve the picture, although we are saying to government it's a great start, please do more of this. Um, but it, of course it is going to continue to be a challenge. Um, the Sorry, I've now completely lost where I am in my notes. Um, we did a survey very recently where we asked working parents and carers. So working parents constitute around 13 million of the workforce, which is, I think, 40, 45% of the workforce. So it's a significant number of people. Um, and we asked them what, how they experienced work. 41% of them, and this was 41% of women, said being a parent was holding them back from promotion at work. 50% of those with additional caring responsibilities for an adult, sick, elderly, disabled family member said the same. And 30% of men who had children said exactly the same. So that's a third of men are saying that their promotion is being held back because of their caring responsibilities. And half of working parents disagreed that senior leaders in their organizations are positive role models for achieving a good work-life balance. Person, the charity is called a work-life balance charity. Personally, I'm not very keen on that because I don't think that's a really good descriptor of what life looks like. It's much messier. You can't just be at work and just be at home. Things bleed into one another. But certainly, the ability to prioritize family or other commitments is something that is absolutely critical and culturally needs to be led from the top. Um, 41% of working parents, however, did say that the pandemic had a positive impact on workplace culture at their organization. And the culture was also about the way in which well-being was being managed within their organization. Um, and a third of working parents and half of carers said that once lockdown was over, they were concerned that taking time off for caring needs would be frowned upon at work again. So we also ran a survey in the summer which said that 40% of working parents had experienced that the, their caring and their domestic responsibilities were being shared much, much more equally than pre-pandemic. But again, what we are tending to be talking about are the haves in the world of flexible working. Those people who have access to it, which tends to be people who are earning more money, um, and those people who are what we would call knowledge workers, again, those people who are able to work partly from home. Um, I have some concluding remarks. I will go to my final page. <laughs> Um, so we know that the UK has long had a labour market that is incompatible with the needs of modern families. Our research has consistently found that those on the highest incomes and in the most senior roles are the most likely to have accrued control over the working time they need. Before the pandemic, two-thirds of parents, 67% of parents earning over 50,000 a year worked flexibly, compared to two in five parents earning between 15 and 20,000. 58% of parents told us they worked flexibly in 2015, but that had dropped to 55% in 2020. And again, as has, has been said before, low-paid, insecure work is the only way for most people to get flexibility within their working lives, which tends, as I've said, because caring is a gendered issue, tends to fall more on women. Um, and the other two other groups to think about. 2.1 million parents were working in a self-employed um, way, working for an agency, or on a zero hours contract, or working casually or seasonally. Alongside fluctuating income, those parents on those types of conference have, uh, on types of contracts have far fewer workplace rights. There's an employment bill coming in, we hope, 2022. Um, I'm not hugely hopeful that it will address many of these inequalities, but it would be great to see if it could. For me, the best change is going to be within the world of work, working with as many employers as we can. Thank you. That's great, thanks so much. And I think it's, it's really striking that often, perhaps companies that are employing 
um, people on zero hours contracts and kind of gig economy frameworks often use the language of flexible working. <laughs> and it's very important to kind of call that out and, and delve into what's actually going on. Um, Jagdeep, do you want to go ahead? Thank you very much, Bethan. Um, absolute delight to be back in Bristol. It really is one of my favorite cities. I walk around and uh, feel energized, not only by coming here this morning, but seeing so many young people happy to be out and about again. It's a wonderful place to be. Thank you for inviting me. Lovely to be here this morning. Um, I'm, I think I'm the only macroeconomist uh, on this panel, so I'm a little bit sheepish to be in such company. But let me think about what my job this morning is. And I think that's to sort of think about what we learned about the macroeconomy, the big picture stuff, um, over the last year or so, when we, fortunately for most of us, lived through COVID. Let's not forget that many people didn't live through COVID. And it's been an awful period uh, for many people in this country and around the world. And that's the first point I feel I have to make, that we are still under the cloud uh, of COVID. And it's not clear um, that we're emerged from that cloud yet, looking at some of the numbers that are around the place. So that's the limit of my epidemiological advice this morning, but I feel I have to stay very careful. It's a truism in macroeconomics that a, a crisis reveals the risks that have been building up previously or in normal times. And I think Abby and Jane have pointed to that already. Um, the risks in the UK's case have been building up since prior, but prior to the financial crisis 2007-8, which most of you guess were at primary school then, um, which revealed and has subsequently revealed that our model, our economic model, wasn't quite right. We, we bolted onto a model that was about globalization, openness to trade, and a heavy reliance on the financial sector, which if you add in professional services such as accountancy and insurance possibly accounted for anything up to 18% of value added in the country, a huge sector, much larger than manufacturing. Um, and what that led to was, is a number of jobs attached to that, very much based around the southeast and London, um, and elsewhere in the country, uh, a preponderance of the kind of low-paid jobs that, that Abby and Jane have been going on. And that, that seems to me the point of departure for the analysis of the period of COVID and subsequently. Because I think what we have to point to are, are two huge failures of economic policy in this country over, the, I'd say, the long decade since 2009. And one is the monetary fiscal mix, which I, I guess is a phrase that is going to bamboozle most people who aren't stupid enough to be macroeconomists. It simply means that the level of interest rates that the Bank of England has been holding has been too low. And fiscal policy, that is the amount of expenditure um, on goods and services or public investment in the economy on a sustained basis has also been too low. Uh, and that, I'll go into the implications of that shortly, but that, that is a, a, a sort of view that the National Institute has taken. And I think that's been very much re revealed by the depth of the crisis that was triggered by the lockdowns in terms of the fact the UK had one of the largest falls in output, that's the quantity of goods and services that we produce every year, compared to any other advanced economy, and is now living through the slowest recovery as well. So it's telling us something deep about the lack of resilience in our economy, the structure, the kind of jobs that we do, the way we do them, and our ability to come out of them, what economists and normal people as well call resilience. So while we're seeing resilience in jobs and employment prospects in the place that I mentioned earlier, London in particular, we're not seeing in other parts of the country, Northern Ireland, the Northwest, when we look down at the regions, we're not seeing prospects for recovery back to the levels that we had in early 2020 till 2023, 2024. And these are significant years lost for people. Uh, I'm at an age where four or five years is quite a large fraction of my life ahead. But it's particularly damaging for young people such as yourselves who are starting in your careers and need to build network and skills and, and some idea of what you want to do. So not only have you had two years where that's been restricted because of COVID, but if you happen to live in parts of the country that are not resilient, you're held back even further. And I know both Sarah and Richard will be able to tell you a lot more about the permanent income consequences of that. Yes, you might get back to some income level in the future, but if we add up all the income that you'll likely have over your life, you're going to be significantly less well off than you would otherwise have been 
Has there not been a COVID shock? In fact, has there not been a Brexit shock? We can talk about that all day if we want as well. Uh, and if we had a more resilient and balanced economy uh, throughout the world that looks like would deliver trains on time, uh, those are all kinds of things. That, okay. so, so, so there are two points here. One is that the monetary fiscal mix is wrong. But secondly, we haven't had sustained regional policies that are building up local areas um, in which there are large numbers of internationally competitive firms exploiting agglomeration effects, producing, yes, high-wage jobs, but also more stable jobs that are related to those high-wage jobs. That's really important to create those centres, and we're just not doing that systematically across the country and, I should say, the devolved nations as well. You've only got to look at some of the issues in Northern Ireland that are running through to realise we've got that wrong. Now, let me go a little bit further uh, into some of these points. I, I just want to make one point, if I may, as well as, and we might argue we were in a reasonable position prior to the COVID crisis. I'm not entirely sure about that. We'd had four or five years where firm investment was significantly below where it would otherwise have been, and that was very much to do with what economists could have measure as uncertainty, and what firms tend to do if they're uncertain about future prospects is hold back investment until they're more certain. And we saw a lot of that in the surveys and the analysis we've done at the macro level from 2016 onwards. I leave you to sort of work out what the causal factor might have been, uh, but I can give you a clue if it begins with a B. Lots of delay from firm investment, and also on the margin, um, some reduction in our labour supplies, migration that sort of sloughed off in that period, and was triggered even further by COVID. So people saying to themselves, I'm in this country for a while, COVID's come along, I'm going to go home, will I come back again? The answer is no. And we're seeing labour supply shortages as a result of that. So part of the supply shortage that we're seeing in the economy are also a result of the lack of capacity that was built up on the firm investment side in the last five years, as well as some loss in migration, uh, a pool of migration labour as well, which exacerbates the supply side problems and makes the current inflation problem more problematic than it otherwise be. So I just want to, even though I agree we were in reasonable shape compared to where we are now, we, we were not in a rosy situation in early 2020 by any means. Um, if I may sort of go on with, with sort of two stylized facts, or three, that, or maybe, maybe that's four. As all economists, I can't count very well. I think, I, think, I think there are three that leads to a fourth. Anyway, I'll stop there. Um, if I take the long decade, 2009 onwards, so go back to this point about wages. If we look at an index of real wages, total real wages in the, in the UK, produced by the ONS, Office of National Statistics, what we find is um, in, in 2009, it was at 491 pounds was the real wage weekly index. At the beginning of 2020, it was 503. Complete sort of flat line, 12 years, 11 years in real wages in this country. Um, of course, in a deep level, as you'll know from your lecture, that's related to labour productivity and how productively all that stuff. But that itself is some function of the economic structure, the firms, the way they invest in people, the way they develop skills, people's issues of tenure, the quality of management. It's, a, it's related to a bunch of stuff, right? <laughs> labour doesn't just get a wage as a result of how hard it works. It depends upon the structure in which it works. So that's really... So real wages haven't moved. At the same time... As interest rates have been so low, we've seen a very large increase in asset prices. Um, the average house price, if such a notion exists, it's very hard to get an average in many ways in economics, but the average house price. 2009 was 150,000 pounds. At the start of the COVID period, it was 250,000 pounds. Huge increase. So if you want to imagine yourself, if you want to move from one part of the country to the other, and if the house price is also an indicator of rents, it becomes very hard to move, reducing labour mobility as well. So it makes you stuck in a particular area. Equity prices, the, the FT100, similarly gone up from something like 5,500 to 7,500. These are 50 to 60% increases in financial and housing wealth in the last 12 years, which is something that seems to me has driven wealth inequality. And if we add that up at the whole household level, household wealth... In, uh, sorry, not net wealth. So this is the asset side of the balance sheet. There's a liability side. Liability is about two trillion. The asset side is over 11 trillion pounds, which, if you divide by the population, gets to about 175,000 pounds per person. Now, I, I could be wrong, 
but there aren't many people in this room that maybe have £135,000 of assets on their balance sheet. Uh, so that tells you it's probably pretty badly skewed out there as well. A lot of people in this room, and very few of those level of assets in there. So the net worth of the household sector is very large indeed at the moment. And I think that is a cause for concern as we move on. Is that what kind of further inequalities will that bring about? There are questions, of course, that during um, you know, one of the great levers in life is, is death, <laughs> in the sense that we'll be transfers to the next generation through that. But it's in a very lumpy way. One of the inter interesting things is that just as we increased home ownership from the 1980s, now it's up to about, again, there are people on this panel who know the numbers better than me, to about 65% of people own their own homes. Exactly that time, longevity increased. So you've got older and older people holding houses that are more and more expensive, arguably leading to the denial of opportunities for younger people to get started, either in terms of being mobile or getting their own homes, or if some of that was used to fund public investment, that might give them more opportunities as well. Interesting thing to look at as well is public investment. So this goes back to my point about fiscal policy. I really could go on all day about this. So I, I'm going to limit myself mercifully just a couple of minutes. If that's okay. Look at fiscal policy. What we've had in the last 10 or 12 years is fiscal policy has been completely upside down. There's a, been something called a bunch of fiscal rules, which is about agreeing that at some point at the end of a parliament, there'll be a budget balance on fiscal policy. Now, just to, again, your economic students, but the way to think about fiscal policy and the deficit is it's an instrument. It's not a target. It's something you use to try and get the economy in the right place. To be clear, no one is arguing for the state to take over all of private activity. But what we argue for is where there are genuine market failures, where there need to be public goods, skills, investment, education, infrastructure are classic areas of public goods. That is the responsibility of the state. And it shouldn't be crimped by an artificial target for deficit, particularly if the target is over a parliament. The economic cycle, so the requirements of society, do not coincide with those of a parliament. The parliament, artificially, is now five years, might run out in 2025. We just don't know what shock may come along next year or the year afterwards. We can't tell fiscal policy that it can and can't do something just because a shock has come along, but it's outside of the scope of a parliamentary term. So there has to be more responsibility for that. I think the fiscal rules have allowed policymakers to absolve themselves from the responsibility of building up public investment and public sector networks in a way that would leave all of us, and particularly you guys, with more opportunities as we move ahead. And I think that's been a first order failure of policy in the last 12 years. This, this, this attempt to um, renege on the responsibility to build a better society and by filling in particular market failures. Um, I, 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 um, yeah, I mean, again, a stylized fact there is, is that over this long decade, public investment has been around 2% or less of GDP. In the period after World War II, um, it was on average much more between 4 and 5% of GDP. Now, I'm not saying we should compare the two. There's clearly a need for rebuilding after World War II. But it's also clear that if we can get that right, particularly after having left the, Europe, left the European Union, think about long-term investment funds. That would be very helpful, both from the public sector and the private sector. It's not clear to me we've got that in any way quite right at the moment. And that sort of leads to the point about regional regeneration. We really don't like the term levelling up. It's confusing levelling with up. It's, it's a very awkward phrase. I'd rather not use it. <coughs> at all, but what we need is regional regeneration, the idea of particular regions that need infrastructure, local skills, firms that can provide people with serious, stable jobs over their lifetimes, uh, and, and that's not something that w w I think there's a credible plan in place at the moment. There's a white paper that's being developed, but I'm not holding my breath to be particularly excited by that uh, in any way. So, so where, where would I try and draw some lessons from? One thing that did work in the end was, was furlough, help people stay in work, it helped the unemployment rate not rise unduly. But if I could just take you back a little bit, when furlough was first introduced, something that the National Institute was very much behind, um, it was originally going to stop last July, uh, July 2020. And we were very clear in saying, and I'm sorry to introduce a sort of macroeconomics term, but 
we were very clear, it should not be time dependent. You shouldn't artificially, it's a bit like the fiscal rules. You don't make it time dependent, you make it state dependent. As long as there's a COVID crisis out there, you allow firms to have further and you extend it potentially in the ways that, that you've both talked about. So then you provide firms with some certainty and employees with some certainty that some income is going to continue to come in and they don't access loans from other parts um, uh, or, or other areas that are more problematic. And we worked very hard last year to, to try to convince the, the Treasury to make that a much longer uh, period of furlough, which in the end they, were, they, they, they decided to do. And I'm glad it's kind of come to an end at a time when we're almost potentially emerging from COVID. But I'd still like to say statements that if the worst happens again, it would be introduced. And that's, that's kind of where policy ought to be, much more state dependent. Say we will do what is required to get things into the right place. We don't hear enough statements along those lines. One thing we particularly hear are just leaks uh, that don't really help anything particularly. So I think we've learned that um, health and the economy are inextricably linked. There's no trade-off between the two. We need to move better, more live jobs into the health and social care sector. We need to decide how to fund that. We can't build an economy just around the city and the jobs that go with the coffee houses around them. That is something that needs to be uh, built as well. And that all really comes down to three main points. Building labor skills, not only at school and university, but beyond. Having firms participate in that in a serious way. Too few firms want to involve themselves in skilling people up. They sort of generally think, why should I skill someone up? They're only going to go to a job somewhere else. They're not participating in the way that we would like. Maybe that's a market failure the government can address uh, as well encourage more firm investment, more, f more investment from overseas. One thing that's happened since 2016 is that FDI, that input of investment and know-how from overseas firms who are doing things very well, has also dried up. We've learned a lot in this country from Japanese investment in car manufacturing uh, industries and elsewhere. L much of that has dried up in the last five years as well. If we can get more of that in, that would be very helpful. Uh, as well, finally, as a serious address a uh, serious attempt to address the shortfalls in public investment uh, by the authorities. And finally, if you want to come along tomorrow, we'll talk about monetary policy and, and how interest rates should go up. Thank you very much. No, no problem. Thank, thank, thanks very much. Um, and I'll, I'll go straight on to, to Sarah. Um, uh, um, yeah. Thank, thank, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, having me on the panel and organising this event. Um, also, hello to lots of students I uh, recognize, well done for getting up uh, so early on a Thursday morning. Um, so I, I had prepared some remarks about gender. I think there's a bit of slight lack of coordination because it's turning into a bit of a gender panel. Um, and I think a lot of the discussion about gender is sort of particularly relevant to sort of women in the sort of 30 uh, sort of plus age range. I mean, sort of typically what <coughs> we know about the gender pay gap is there is one when you enter the labor market. So there's a gender pay gap even sort of for, for graduates at kind of age 21, 22, but actually it only really starts to open up uh, in a very sort of significant way once you have kids. So a lot of you might be sort of uh, finding this um, sort of conversation about gender pay gaps and childcare and gender inequality sort of something that maybe doesn't feel so immediately relevant to your life. So I'll come back and talk slightly about the way in which I think it matters to sort of even to sort of, you know, the people your age. But I will also make some remarks about age and the, the massive age inequalities because they might also be relevant. So that this is slightly going off piece off my notes. Richard might be able to pick up on it as well. But having three people talk exclusively about sort of gender <laughs> to a room of people for whom children might seem a little way off, I thought maybe might, might, might kind of uh, lose the audience. Okay, so um, yeah, so the UN described uh, the pandemic as sort of rolling back uh, years and years of gender equality, and I, I think that's true. So they were talking about developed and developing countries and, and sort of gender violence, but even if you take most of Western developed countries, it is true that uh, sort of the pandemic has rolled back gender equality in a way that I'm sort of will we'll make quite specific in a minute. Um, so the recession that came out of the pandemic was very different to recessions of the past. So recessions are typically worse for men because they hit, sort of tr at least in the UK, they've hit traditional jobs. Uh, the pandemic recession was worse for women, first of all, because of the sectors that were hit. I mean, obviously they were protected in the UK because of the furlough program, but many women 
chose the furlough and chose to reduce their hours because they were the ones taking the brunt of the childcare. I mean, the extent of the increase in childcare that was sort of shifting from sort of formal paid sector to informal sector in the house was quite staggering. So I was quite interested in, you know, the COVID as a sort of shock and would this lead to a, 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 a radical transformation in the way childcare was done? You know, it was a huge opportunity. It turns out gender norms are incredibly strong. So, you know, when there was a massive increase in, in requirement for uh, childcare to be done in the home, women bore uh, the brunt of it. So, you know, in normal times, women do about 66% of childcare. In COVID, women were doing about 66% of the additional childcare. And that additional childcare was huge. So people were reporting they were doing around 40 hours extra childcare and they were working. So what was interesting actually was women were juggling much more than men. So there were some households where men increased their childcare, but only when they were on furlough. Women increased their childcare, whatever they were doing. You know, so they were juggling when they were working and they were even you know, doing extra childcare when they weren't working. The gender norms were sort of dictating how, how, how kind of like the, the pandemic played out in terms of childcare. I mean, this matters for a number of reasons. It w that, that the implications for this will continue longer term for three reasons. One, there's scarring, you know, so short term effects on your productivity last a long time. If you don't work, uh, that kind of has a permanent effect, partly because of the way uh, skills and experience are recognized in the formal labor market. Um, and this is going to be very relevant for young people too. So sort I of might come back to this in a minute. Second, the childcare infrastructure, which has been talked about, took a massive hit. So uncertainty affected the ability of nurseries and um, early years childcare to operate effectively. And there's been this shortage of um, workers and, and you know, many, many, many nurseries are sort of struggling. <laughs> so the Daily Mail had a great story about uh, a very wealthy Londoners fighting uh, for nannies and paying 70,000. I mean, that's a very sort of high profile example of a major problem which is hitting the childcare sector. And this lack of investment in core infrastructure and thinking about childcare as core infrastructure is a real problem. Uh, the third um, reason, and this is perhaps, uh, I think, really relevant to you, is what, what's surprised me is there's growing evidence from a number of countries of a conservative shift in gender norms. So, you know, the, the, the last 30 years have been, you know, progress in, in kind of like, uh, so people's attitudes towards gender roles. So there's a number of surveys which have been going on for, for several years, which ask people, you know, do you think women uh, should stay at home and look after the children? You know, do you think it's the responsibility of men to go out to work? There's huge variation across countries if you look at Western Europe and US but the trajectory has been sort of towards more progressive attitudes over the last few decades. In Germany, France, and the US, that the evidence isn't there yet for the UK as far as I know, there's been a, a step back in terms of people um, reporting more traditional uh, norms around the roles of men and women. Many more men are now likely to say it's the, it's the uh, role of women to stay at home, it's the role of men to go out to work. Um, this may be temporary, but you know, I, I, you know, this is where the UN is exactly right that the COVID pandemic has set back gender equality for years. You can literally see these gender norms which really drive behavior having sort of gone to levels they were sort of five, six, seven, ten years ago. So you know, I think that is very uh, important going forward unless we see kind of continued progress. Um, I've heard quite a lot about um, working from home and working flexibly. I think that's, that's a huge opportunity. And for you, I think the, you know, hopefully what will come out of this is a shift to more flexible work and working from home, which works for everyone. You know, often it's not the problem, the, the problem is not childcare and the economics of household labor. The problem is the economics of work and the all consuming nature of the work and the fact that it's you know, very difficult to manage you know, a sort of work-life balance or children when work demands so much. I was absolutely horrified by the Goldman Sachs um, survey, you know, showing that, that, that Goldman Sachs was demanding you know, 110 hours uh, to the detriment of mental health, uh, any other outside activities and physical health. And you know, hopefully the pandemic and you know, an increased premium on and demand for working flexibly and working uh, in a more balanced way will help to address this. Um, so I wanted to sort of, so I, I mean, coming back to uh, sort of younger people, you know, this is perhaps an opportunity to demand a different sort of work and a different sort of uh, work-life balance. And perhaps, you know, the pandemic can leave a legacy of, um, of, of, of something that kind of 
is 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 more uh, is more amenable to having sort of children and 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 not kind of um, having the sort of the, the the types of very unequal burdens of childcare that fell on men and women uh, sort of further down the line. Um, there was a sort of so so uh, when I was looking at kind of the unequal ef gender effects um, of the pandemic. One of the ways you can capture this is not only looking by econ at economic outcomes, but at looking at mental health. So women's mental health suffered much more than men's mental health during the pandemic. You might expect that to be the sort of the juggling sort of 30, 40 year olds. Actually, it was young people and young women's mental health that suffered most during the pandemic. So young, so of all the people who suffered, if you take mental health as an as a indicator of suffering, were young women. And young women's mental health suffered much more than men's mental health. Possibly they were more happy to sort of talk about it, but I think there was something there about young women and lockdown that was particularly difficult for them. Um, you know, I think clearly there are many other ways in which the pandemic has massively impacted young people. Inequalities within education have become much more pronounced. The ability of different types of schools to deliver online education was massively different, and that's going to have scarring effects. The furlough program protected workers in work, but it did, do, it did nothing for workers who were trying to enter the labor market, and there are many workers, many young workers, who, who or potential workers, who weren't able to get jobs they will have a similar scarring effect that was sort of talked about. These short-term uh, sort of events can have very long-term implications. Um, and, you know, so in terms of sort of, you know, universities, you know, I, I think the whole experience, the quality of the education, it was very hard to maintain uh, in a world in which we couldn't deliver things um, as, as they were. Um, a number of other sort of issues that uh, Judge, it's already picked up in terms of you know young people. We are looking at increasingly intergenerational differences in terms of the assets people have, um, and you know, and the opportunities that they have. You know, a world in which you no longer expect automatically to be richer or wealthier than your parents is a very different world than the one that that kind of we were we were going into. Um, so yeah, so I, you know, I, I do ask questions about you know intergenerational inequalities and how they've been exacerbated from the pandemic. We've heard a lot about gender; that's important. The intergenerational aspects are important too. Um, uh, you know, why nightclubs and not childcare? So um, you know, I, I think we also you know the a final point is you know I think these discussions about you know what the pandemic means for gender inequality, what the pandemic means for. Uh, intergenerational inequality are hugely important and there is an opportunity to think very systematically about this. I think I used to think about the uh, COVID and the pandemic as just sort of putting the, the economy and our world on standby and we would just restart it as it was. That's clearly no longer possible um, you know, because of all the long-term implications. There is a, an opportunity to talk you know, really quite um, you know, I think in a forward thinking way about how things could be different, how we could have flexible working, how we could have, you know, infrastructure investment that included childcare as well as HS2. Um, but perhaps I think it might take another set of politicians. <laughs> so we know that the leadership matters. So, you know, so uh, students from Bristol have heard me talk about how, you know, studies have found that female leaders did better um, in, uh, than male leaders in terms of COVID deaths and COVID sort of cases, and it may well be that the sort of the leadership matters for how we come out of the pandemic as much as how we dealt with the pandemic. Uh, and when I looked at this, so um, sort of, uh, after a year, it was International Women's Day a year after the pandemic, so I went back through all the COVID briefings that we'd had, and out of 67, only one had been given by a woman, um, and only one, you know, and none had been given anyone who was sort of of your age. So, you know, I, I think we need people, we need, we need to have a sort of diverse set of people coming to the table in order to think systematically about all of these issues and think how to uh, address the inequalities that COVID has highlighted. Thanks very much. And um, yeah, given given the importance of intergenerational inequality, after our last speaker, I'll open questions to the floor um, and we'll be very keen to, to, to hear what some of you think. Um, but first of all, um, yeah, get, please go ahead, Richard. <laughs> okay, th thanks. It's uh, great to be back in Bristol. It's where I became an economist and quite a few other things too. Um, and thanks to everyone at Economics Observatory uh, doing a great job. I mean, it's, it's a fantastic uh, initiative. Um, my take, we've covered a lot of ground, so I'm not going to try and recover that. 
what I was thinking of here was um, it, it's, it's about fairness and inequality, but you know, what were the kind of underlying um, concerns about fairness before the pandemic and I in these various uh, dimensions that we've been discussing? How did the pandemic kind of affect them? Uh, and what do we think is happening in our post-pandemic economy when we eventually get there? Um, so I'm going to think about the kind of role of skills, labor market, and, um, and good jobs, actually. So it fits in quite well with everything that's been uh, talked about here. In fact, I've been part of a, like many of us, looking at reviews of inequality because inequality and fairness have become such a key issue mm -hmm. that, you know, it required, you know, we felt as economists, many of us, that we needed to be a little bit more serious about looking into inequality. And you've already heard there's a number of reviews of different aspects of inequality, and we have been uh, running one called the Deaton Review, which started before the pandemic uh, with Angus Deaton, uh, a professor of, of, uh, at Bristol in economics <laughs> uh, some time ago, uh, and a Scot. Um, he, um, he chairs this inequality. I only wanted to reflect on that because just when the, uh, in January 2020, when the pandemic had hit China, but it hadn't quite got to us, but it was obvious it was coming, <laughs> we kind of thought, well, maybe inequality concerns would just be put on hold because it wasn't clear at that time how it would play out. After all, you know, the only places where the pandemic was beginning to hit were in actually thriving cities, London and Southeast. It was hitting the old and, um, at the health issues there, a and you might think, well, that's going to be a very different take on the implications for inequality, but it didn't take long to figure out that that, that wasn't going to be the long-run effect. In fact, it went back to something that highlighted what we the concerns we already had, and uh, that's kind of interesting. The way I was thinking of it was uh, around the things we've heard of. I think the education inequalities are really key here. This panel isn't about education, but it's hard to, tr you know, separate that from everything we've heard, whether it be what parents are able to deliver at home and, and what students are getting both in, uh, in, in school and in university, and indeed what young workers are getting in terms of their training, all of which have been uh, cut back, and they've been cut back in a highly unequal way. In fact, work done in Bristol has shown the importance of the, uh, the inequalities in, in delivery of uh, school education. It's quite remarkable, actually. Mm. The, um, we already had three, you know, we, we were very concerned about the unequal inputs in education. Um, parental investments and different types of schools already giving a huge inequality. Um, and that was more about our concerns about social mobility. And to me, Social mobility is the core of unfairness I or lack of social mobility. It's not just the core of unfairness, it's the core of an economy going completely wrong. It's the undermining of meritocracy if we ever had it. <laughs> and those kind of things I think are really key. And we were already worrying the, the amount of the differences between the inputs and among, uh, 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 um, among the, the richer parent from richer parents and uh, in private schools and uh, top state schools versus others, much of it regional. And, uh, and I think uh, regional things have become much more salient in our minds. And the economists have also been a bit slow on the uptick on that, by the way. Now we're all <laughs> becoming place-based <laughs> economists and, uh, and a bit, bit late in the game, but <laughs> very important. And what happened is the pandemic just made this much worse. You know, the poor had less space at home, they were less, you know, the poor, the parents of, poorer parents are less educated generally, and so their own inputs are going to be uh, less, there's less space, there's less input, there was less digital access, and, you know, the remarkable effects were at the bottom of the state school uh, distribution, there was very, very little input in the access to online input and other inputs during the first lockdown, it didn't get that much better in the second lockdown. Whereas in uh, I, I private school children got 
got uh, about 60, 70, 80 percent of what they were getting from school and a good deal meal more at home. Mm. And I think this, I this is pretty important. Um, you know, there's a bounce back going on and it's, it's, it's given a rather rosy picture. But I think what you have to think about is the loss that lots of people have suffered. And economists think dynamically. You know, we think that, um, you know, inputs of investments in education take time to come through. And we've lost two or three years for some people, and others haven't. And, uh, you know, that's, I think, the first big policy is just a program of, a huge program of getting that right. Um, earnings inequality, you know, that, that's been worrying uh, us a lot. Um, and, um, uh, uh, you know, we've heard about that. Uh, but it's not just low wages. Um, it's just rotten jobs. And uh, low wages, I think Abby got it kind of right and others here about low progression. I've got kind of extremely uh, kind of worried about progression. That is, you're in a job and it goes nowhere. And if you look at what people don't like about jobs, it's jobs that go nowhere. They have no career progression, no opportunities. And we saw an increase in those kind of jobs. Um, of course, there's those kind of jobs are typically worked by people who didn't go to university. And there has been an increase in those going to university. So there's a, there's a bit of both uh, going on here. But I think that's where we should be looking. And it put a lot of challenge of someone from, I also work at the Institute of Fiscal Studies. You know, we're thinking about pro transfer programs and benefits. You know, the old idea of uh, the way our system in the UK uh, and other countries around Europe and North America were designed was you design a system that was about welfare to work. You get people into work. Once they're in work, they might need support for a while, but then they earn their way off it. That just didn't turn out to be the case. What we found is, I think this was remarked on, you get, uh, especially parents, I even though they're encouraged to work and we have quite high employment, they're still um, receiving a huge amount of in-work benefit, in-work support. And even the minimum wage doesn't offset that. It helps, but it doesn't offset that. So we've got something that's supposed to get people into work and into self-sufficiency, and it doesn't. And it leaves you with very little prospect of wage growth and also getting uh, handouts from the state, if you want to think of it like that. That's not a great place to be uh, through most of your working life. And I think that's uh, really key here. And of course, it would be particularly the case for single parent, in fact, low mothers who are in part-time work. That would, be, that would be just a typical case there. And I think it's really important. And of course, these, um, you know, when you look at what's happened with the pandemic, it's a technology effect, really. I think in the long run, it's going to be very beneficial for those with skills and, and education and, and not very beneficial for the rest because it's a shift, of shift towards more technology jobs. And it's great for many of you and many of us in the long run, but it won't be great for many others. And it just kind of exacerbates the things I was I was saying. We've heard about a lot of gender inequality, so I'm not going to go back to that, although I think it's, it's really uh, key here. What we saw was an increase in in-work poverty, actually, and that hasn't gone away, and I'll come back to that a bit. And you put it together with increasing wealth inequalities, which we've also heard described, and that's uh, important. The way I see it is that, um, and we again, we got onto this a little bit late as economists, is that it all came together in certain geographic locations. And uh, you find, you know, there's geographic locations accentuating, as I've written here, because I have to look, um, <laughs> uh, uh, um, you know, regional and geographic inequalities. And that's what's led, um, if you look at it, uh, to, uh, you know, disenchantment with the political system, with voting for Brexit, with the decline of the Red Wall. I could go through it mm -hmm. many, many times. And really what's happened is that, um, you know, you get pockets of deprivation which are, are quite large. What characterizes those? I'm going to pick on one thing which might be interesting for you, and that's what I'm going to call educational flight. Mm. And uh, it's quite remarkable. I don't know whether any of you are from Grimsby or Skegness. If you grew up in Grimsby or Skegness, you would have had less chance of going to university. In fact, about 20% 
of kids um, in Skegness and Grimsby go to university. It's up to tw twice that in the southeast. But what's remarkable is even if you went to university from Grimsby, you're not going to hang around in Grimsby. You're going to get out. And there's a 40% decline or loss of those that got university education staying in Grimsby and Skegness. <laughs> it's funny that they happen to all be in the northeast or Lincolnshire or in the southwest in places that we know were particularly um, both Red Wall and Brexit areas. And you kind of think this is really challenging because um, getting, uh, you know, We've been doing a lot of work on what, uh, what, are, what, are, what are good jobs. And good jobs are the ones I described. And you don't get good jobs in warehouses. You don't get good jobs if you're an outsource cleaner or a driver, actually. And um, the key point here is that, uh, I think Dag mentioned it, uh, agglomeration. And the worst situation for trying to attract good jobs to an area is having fewer educated workers. In fact, you need both. And it's very, very obvious that we've been looking, using the vast amount of data you can, you can now look at in the UK, following workers through their careers. Um, and what you, you look at, those who are, are lower educated, some make, make good, some do very well, actually. And where do they do well? They do well in firms that already have high educated workers, so they've got a good mix. And they tend to be tech firms, actually, or frontier firms, good firms. And, um, and you can see how challenging that is, because uh, when, when we were looking at uh, towns like Rochdale, which is a, a, a very deprived town and uh, deprived of good jobs, uh, the solution has been where investment has come in to, pr to, to invest in warehouses because the type of workers there work very well in warehouses. They're relatively low skilled, but those jobs are going nowhere. And it really, uh, when you think about how we're going to uh, get this to work, you have to think about education flight and policies to reverse that. And I think that's, that's key. And, um, and the type of skills. So it's about the type of skills, I won't go into that, um, and the type of firms. Um, putting that to, together, I was thinking, what are the big policy challenges here? Well, one is the large-scale programs that make up for the education loss. And by the way, the biggest education loss has been in the north of England. Mm. And uh, it's kind of shocking, but, but true. And among poorer households, mm. that's not unrelated. Um, and uh, we need to rethink and enhance vocational training. It was already a mess. Our, our vocational training system in the UK is horrible, and it's really di become dysfunctional during COVID because um, it's a workplace. Where it works, it's workplace-based, and there hasn't been a workplace to work in. And so if you look at apprenticeships, they've just disappeared. They weren't very high, but they disappeared over the COVID. So a huge loss. And uh, that's, you know, that's the second bit, education, uh, training, and childcare. But I'm not going to go into that. Uh, the other thing is, what do we do about wealth inequalities? Um, if you're looking for income, then why don't we tax wealth better? Uh, it's not really difficult to figure out how to do that better. In fact, we had a report 10 years ago <laughs> in Murley's review, which exactly pointed to the way we, you know, improve in the way we cap tax capital gains, uh, including housing capital gains, by the way, um, and, uh, and inheritance. And if you want to get at really where the big generational inequalities are going to come from, they're going to come from capital and inheritance as well as the education ones. Uh, but I'd like to end on a, on a positive note uh, <laughs> because I think there are opportunities. You know, with a crisis, just like the Second World War, <laughs> um, you know, there's opportunities here, and I was thinking about that. One is there's a change of attitudes. It's depressing what Sarah said about changing norms. But I thought, I was hoping you might say, well, more men have been looking after children. Of course, women have been doing all, mothers have been doing much more. But still, there's just been more childcare in the home. And maybe they figured out that it's, uh, it requires a little bit of reorganization of work and effort. And I remember at um, 
uh, at IFS, actually, we, uh, where Sarah was working at one time, you know, we always had our seminars in the evening. And that's a pretty shocking thing. Seminars are where you make your show. You know, you ask questions <laughs> and you show how great you are as an economist. <laughs> and, um, of course, you know, people with childcare had to leave. And, lo and you know, that's often women. And I, I was l reflecting on why are all the seminars now at lunchtime? And then I thought about it and I realized that's because a lot of the men are now looking after children and they've also figured out it didn't work very well. And uh, I think somebody mentioned how it takes men to be put in that situation mm. to get things changed. And uh, maybe that's a rather horrible way to get things changed, but it's possible. And we might see a bit of that. Also, I think it was mentioned about you know, large scale policies. There's an appetite for that. We spent a huge amount of money and uh, maybe we could do more of that. Long term borrowing, why, why not? I also think y people have experienced the welfare state in a way they've never experienced. By the way, you know, in every country in Europe, inequality actually fell during the uh, pandemic. It's the first time ever in a recession inequality has gone down. I should say inequality of income, not of work mm. and those <laughs> things, or childcare, but in or mental health, but inequality of income. And that is quite remarkable. If you look at inequality before policy, it's got huge. But so there really was a will, and it, it kind of worked. And it worked off that, you know, we had to reinvent our social safety net mm. overnight. It wasn't bad, actually, mm. what happened. National Institute, others worked mm. on that, which is, was, was great. And so I, I think there, there are, um, there are uh, positives here. When it comes to the kind of last bit, leveling up, uh, I don't like it either, <laughs> but the geographical inequalities. I think, you know, the health, the kind of, these pockets of, of either old people or lower educated young people, which unfortunately defines Grimsby, Skegness, and left behind areas, you know, that's kind of focused on the health, economic, and education disadvantage. And maybe, you know, we've realized that that's just a horrible combination, and there's a, there could be a will to actually get place based policies that work uh, post COVID. Uh, to do something about that. So um, I think we wouldn't be in economics if we weren't o optimistic, because when you start economics, you realize, you know, how, how potentially bad things are, but how the f also the potential for fixing things. And so just to end on that, there are positives here if we grasp them. And, uh, and I would say, you know, there's an opportunity for that. And I think we... Uh, you know, that's a slightly more positive <laughs> note to end on. <laughs> good, good, Sorry, good to end on, on a positive <laughs> note. And I, I, I think the point about sort of intergenerational inequality is, is really important there, but also it's important to remember that it's not just intergenerational, it's kind of ex exacerbating existing inequalities around things like, you know, parental assets, if you're going to buy a mm. house and educational yeah. inequalities. So the intersections there are really important. Um, has anyone got any questions? I'm going to skip straight to the, the floor. Yeah. And we've got a roving microphone. Um, thank you very much for the interesting panel. I'm, a, I'm Annabelle. I'm an economic student at the University of Bristol. And I'd like to ask the panel whether they are hopeful for the state of inequality in the UK over the next 10 years. <laughs> Anyone, uh, anyone want to jump to that particularly? I mean, I ended uh, on an optimism. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're you're um, clearly uh, hopeful. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm not so sure I'm really hopeful. <laughs> but I, I, uh, but uh, I don't think I should answer that one as I kind of got there at the end, but uh, others might want to. J Jane, you're kind of working quite closely and seeing what's <laughs> going on on the ground with working families. I mean, what's your sense? I th uh, yeah, I think it's very tricky. Um, I think 10 years is quite a short period of time. I do think that um, many employers in the country are doing what they can, um, but the biggest thing that they could do is invest in the people that they employ with upskilling, and that is something that, unless there's a lot of support from government, is going to be very difficult to get. So I'm not wildly optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
but I think your generation will do much better than mine did, so <laughs> <laughs> give it 30 years, you'll be fine. Yeah, I guess I would just kind of echo both um, Richard's <laughs> points and Jane's, just to say that there is opportunity, like that there is opportunity here, especially with if you think about just like the scale of the furlough scheme, mm. the government was paying like a huge number of people's mm. wages, eighty percent of people's wages for mm -hmm. you know a significant period of time. I think if you, I think if we take a poll of the people in this room in February twenty twenty, would the government that we have yeah. be doing that I think we would have all have said no but really when you know as Richard said inequality like so we haven't had the, the kind of the the the, the job tsunami um, inequality at least in measured consum in measured income not in consumption um, has uh, you know not not kind of not not increased um, but I think kind of I guess the, the thing that I'd like to say is like it, it requires action and it does require kind of ambitious bold policies rather than this kind of tacking in here and there of putting in s in, in, in safety plasters and that's the thing I'm a little bit more pessimistic about in terms of going forward but you know hopefully we can learn from the big bold things that did happen over COVID. I guess, that, I mean, one of the biggest risks surely is the sort of misperception about government debt, because I think that the biggest risk is re government retrenchment and a sudden mm -hmm. cutback in spending and this idea that, you know, government debt is a bad thing and it's increased and we need to do something about it really quickly, which is also a, shi a shift in attitude which is required as well as a bit of, as well as a sort of uh, economic knowledge about, you know, government spending and the ability to repay in, an e in a growing economy. So I think, I think that that would be a, a, a risk, I think, yeah. there. I just want to uh, pick up one thing. That there's a canard that goes around that say economists can't agree with each other. There's a lot of agreement uh, <laughs> on the panel today. I couldn't agree more with what Sarah said about public debt and also Abby said about crisis management. We, we have politicians and economic leadership in this country that is always about the next crisis. So we need to find a way of building different institutional mechanisms so that we can think better about the long run. The problems we've identified cannot be solved in one year or decade. They are decennial problems. So that means we need to shift the public attitude in the way we've got, galvanise you guys <laughs> to go out there and work towards public policy. My generation, um, somewhere between Richards and uh, <laughs> Sarah's, you know, we're all, we'll all galvanised to go and work in the city. That, that was the ultimate aim at that time. And that didn't work out for the country at large. So if we can galvanise more of you to work in public policy, the workers' economy, work at the IFS or, or the National <laughs> Institute, you know, to try and do some good. And, and also, we need the politicians to be better. They're just really poor, I've got to say, I mean, as a group. Uh, I won't cast, you know, accusations at one party or the other. We meet a lot of them at, at the National Institute, and many of them mean good, intend to do good, but the system and the way that it's set up and the strategies for choosing their leaders, <coughs> Uh, it kind of leads to the kind of guys running the show that you really wouldn't want running anything in some places. And then there's Whitehall. Um, the Treasury is so dominated by controlling public debt, there is no department of the economy thinking about the long run, knitting things together. This is the long time complaint <coughs> before I was born. This is a complaint about economic policy in the country, but it still hasn't been addressed. So these are the things that need to be done. But what you'll find is a lot of support for the economists in, in that. Yeah, I, I, one thing I find really striking, mm. and, and obviously these issues are really complicated, but is that that they're also not a, a complete puzzle in many mm. of mm. these cases. Like we mm. do mm. know to an extent what works mm. and what needs to be done, but getting the the, the money behind that mm. from government is is difficult. Um, I think we've probably got time for t two minutes. So one mm. more question. Anyone? What, one that in, in, in the front row. Um, uh, thanks for that panel. Um, I'm Sam, economist at the Department for Leveling Up. On the uh, education... On the... Um, Marsham Street. Yeah, or, yeah, horrible name, but um, <laughs> I should say that. Um, on the, uh, on the en educational inequalities that you talked about, I was wondering if uh, any of you have like, done some thinking or uh, aware of any research of, like, the practical ways that policymakers can start to like start to reduce that inequality that is developed, or is the sort of scarring effect like way too large for that sort of gap to ever be closed? Is there like investment? I don't know. 
um, just just different policies that can be introduced in schools to be able to start to reduce them, although they they did exist before, but to sort of I don't know get them to levels that are sort of reasonable enough. Um, in in like education. Yeah, 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 yeah. So in terms of just like outcomes for um, schools that had more digital access yeah. um, versus schools that didn't, and that widened the education gap. Yeah, R Richard, I think you, you've done some well, work I can this. start on that. It's yeah. a great question. And these are really difficult because it's, um, it's about the home as well. And um, so digital access, I, I think that's a great opportunity, by the way, yeah. uh, because it, it allows, you know, when you're based in Grimsby, <laughs> if we improve our digital access and the quality of education in the online world, that can help people uh, in school and in their early careers, by the way. I think that's really key, and that's something that's happened. So again, you could be optimistic there. But I think the kind of schooling loss is, is really t terrible. By the way, the other thing about left behind areas, if you look at um, teachers, uh, the, the, and you look at where the teachers, all teachers have some kind of degree, but are they teaching areas in their expertise? If you're in uh, left behind areas, the type I described, where they're less educated anyway, it's much more likely your teachers are not experts in the field of study. Quite interesting, I didn't realize this till recently. So I think the quality and mismatch and allocation of teachers, which is a really hard thing, to, to, to get right is, is, is another part of it. But then just, just programs of, of tutoring and work. You know, what the, what, what the rich and the private schools have known a long time, that mm. those intensive tutoring can, can work. That, but that's terribly expensive. Yeah. But I think it, it's essential. I think this gap is, is huge. It's 18 months of a severe disadvantage in school. And that's gonna show up for a long time. So it's a great question. Uh, this requires really am big ambition across a range of policies, actually. Teachers, provision of, of tutoring and extra education, and the whole uh, digi digital access and what, they what can be accessed online. I, I, I think it's something as well that is, you know, we, we do kind of know what needs to be done, and those interventions are expensive. The government has, to be fair, gone part way and, yeah, and, sure. and taken on some of the lessons around tutoring and so on, but it, it is only, only part of the way. Yeah. Um, w we're out of time, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> any final um, remarks um, from our panelists um, about kind of throwing things forward, any, any key policies um, that you'd really call on the government to, to go full ahead with on <laughs> Christ. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess actually it's actually more just something for like kind of coffee break. So one thing we haven't spoken at all about here is the green transition and how that might kind of interact with um, both the existing kind of place-based policies, but also provide opportunities for organisation around big public investment and potentially skills retraining, which could, you know, actually A, it, anyway, I, I, so I think that it'd be really interesting as well just to say that this is, a, of course, another dimension of inequality which we haven't spoken about today, but should be kind of integrated into how we're thinking about solutions going forward. Um, I mean, Richard mentioned it already, but I, you know, I think the idea of a, a wealth tax seems to be a complete no-brainer. Um, and I'm always staggered that inheritance tax is so unpopular, given who mm. actually pays it. And I, I mean, again, it sort of goes back to the importance of norms and perceptions and driving behaviour, because I think the economics of these taxes is, is, is completely clear. Great. Well, we started the day with some clear direction. <laughs> good. Good to see. Um, thanks very much, everyone. Um, and thanks to our panel.